Uh, my name is Ray Bittigan. Uh, I'm at, uh, with the Photography Council at the Portland Art Museum. Uh, and I'd like to welcome you all to our online version of the Brown Bag Lecture Series. Um, as some of you know, but some of you are guests I see that haven't been before, uh, we have a monthly lecture uh, that we do on the, usually on the third Wednesday of every month, um, where we invite a photographer to speak to our group, uh, talk about their work, and it lasts for about an hour. Um, historically, we've done these live at the museum, but with the pandemic, we're doing them online. And that's been interesting for me because as the host of this, uh, I've been able to invite folks to come uh, show their work and talk about their work who don't necessarily live in Portland, Oregon. So, and also people can attend who don't uh, live in Portland, Oregon. So I'm glad to see you all here. Um, I'm excited. Today's going to be uh, a great talk. We've got Kate Miller Wilson uh, from Minnesota. Uh, and I, uh, we were just talking a minute ago about social media and how I, uh, I became aware of her work uh, on Instagram, like many of you maybe did. Um, and I'm excited to hear and get to know more about her and about how she makes this work and what our feelings are that surround it, because clearly uh, all these pictures are infused with lots of feelings. So please welcome Kate Miller Wilson. Thank you. Thanks, Ray. I'm really honored that you asked me to do this. Um, also really terrified, <laughs> but I'll just do my best. Um, so I will just start the screen share that has my presentation on it. And I'm going to turn off my video because our internet is a little bit buggy with kids doing homeschool also. Um, but I will uh, have some time for questions afterwards also. Okay. Um, so for me, Photography is really about making a connection with people on an emotional level. Um, I grew up with some social challenges in addition to the 80s haircut in this picture. I dealt with a lot of anxiety and um, didn't really know how to play with other kids or really connect with people outside of my family. Um, and that's still kind of hard for me. Um, so I tried to do that with my, with my work. Um, I, I, when I grew up, I became a writer. Um, that helped a lot. It's easier to connect with people through writing for me. But um, socially, it's still, it, I still didn't really have that. And photography is what ended up allowing me to make those connections with other humans. Um, in 2014, my husband gave me a DSLR for Christmas. I had really wanted that because my dad had an SLR when I was growing up and I just loved how a camera could stop time. And when you're a parent, you see time moving so quickly. And just being able to freeze that for a minute is, is important. Um, so I really loved it. I really started shooting all the time. I became obsessed with it, taking hundreds of photos a day, pouring over photos that other people had taken, getting to know other photographers and learning all the time. Um, but I was still basically using my, my camera to document what was happening in my family. And it wasn't really... For me, at least, I didn't consider it to be art yet. Um, so this is the first photo that I made that I really, really started to think of myself as somebody who could have a voice as a photographer. Um, I, when my, not long after my eldest son was born, I had a, an abdominal tumor um, and had to have a major surgery and have my muscles removed. And I was left with a scar and this sort of asymmetrical 
stomach area. And that was, it really was hard for me um, to feel good about that. But I wanted to take a photo that showed how that felt and also how my sons were, that it didn't matter, you know? Um, but when I looked at this picture, it terrified me. The idea of posting it, sharing it with anybody. And I showed it to a friend and he told me that it was the best, most powerful photo I'd, photo I'd ever taken. And that was a surprise to me. And I learned from that, that being vulnerable in your work and showing emotion, that's, those are really powerful things. And investing yourself in a photo allows it to connect to an audience in a way that was something that I had craved my whole life to be able to do that. I learned that that vulnerability is in that emotional power is what makes something art. So um, from the time that my eldest son was a baby, I knew there was something different about him. He cried constantly and he couldn't be soothed. And he didn't look at me or turn to his name, kind of all the red flags that you hear about with autism. He didn't really try to communicate. It was not, it was like I wasn't really there um, as his mom. And so I began intensive therapy with him when he was 12 months old. My mom's a speech pathologist and she helped me figure out some exercises to do with him to try to connect emotionally. And I worked with that and with the schools every day, long checklists, lots of therapy. And all that time, I was really afraid of this idea of autism and that this, that this word was going to describe my child. Eventually we did get that diagnosis, but by that time, all the work I'd done had paid off and he was much more connected and making lots of progress. So by the time I started taking pictures, he was seven or eight years old and his autism was basically just a fact of life. But it also became almost a, another um, subject in my photography. I didn't really start out with a plan to have a series about autism. But after I'd been shooting for a couple of years, it kind of gradually came about. And this photo was one of the first ones I took where I saw that clearly. My son doesn't really make eye contact very much in regular life. He's, he'll glance at you for a second um, as he's talking, but he's mostly sort of looking over your shoulder. And I'm used to that. And it's kind of the way I expect our interactions to go. So one day I was taking photos of him and I took this picture in a reflective wall at our doctor's office. And when I came home that night and was editing my photos, I was completely shocked to see that he was looking at me in the reflection. So the real him isn't looking, but the reflection him is looking right at the camera. And I gasped when I saw that and I felt like I had a chance to capture something using the camera that I might not be able to experience or to share very easily in any other way. I began to take more photos exploring the role of autism in our relationship. Um, it became a kind of play for us, something that we could do together. So he could talk to me about whatever he was interested in at the time. And I could photograph him while we were doing that. When we did this one, he was really obsessed with owls. And so he was pretending to be an owl. And it was just, it was just a really fun way for us to play together. Um, the lens created kind of a barrier between us that made it a little easier to connect in some ways. I think a lot of parent photographers worry about that barrier and worry about being present with their kids while they're shooting. But there's something about that distance of the camera, at least for me, 
that allows for better communication and maybe a better connection. One of the things that I tried to capture in the autism series was the experience of loving someone who's on the spectrum. It's like, my son has described it this way, it's like the, there's a barrier between himself and other people. And it does feel like that. Um, sometimes the barrier is really thick and he's almost impossible to reach. There are fewer of those kinds of days now as he's gotten older, but they were once something that we dealt with all the time. And to explore that idea of the barrier, I tried shooting him through different things, um, through like fabrics or mesh or glass or anything I could find really. Here we had this giant sheet of ice that we suspended over two chairs in our backyard and he lay underneath it and I stood on another chair and shot down through the, the ice to take pictures. I'm sure the stories he will have to tell other people are almost impossible to translate, <laughs> but um, as he's gotten older, the barriers between us have gotten thinner. So on good days, we can see through the barrier and hear through it. It's still there, but it's thin enough to allow us to interact. And I tried to make some photos that show that too, how it can be variable, how some days are easier than other days. There were also some photos in this series that I felt guilty for taking. There's a conflict always between being a mother and being an artist. I try only to take what they offer to me and I try never to take something that will harm them. I never want them to feel like I'm taking advantage of them because they're there to be my subjects. This photo really walked that line for me we were going through a really rough time when his medication wasn't in balance and he was really struggling with his anger. And one morning as I was trying to get him ready for school, he became just furious with me. He was screaming at me and yelling that he hated me. And my camera was sitting right there because I always have it sitting right there. So I grabbed it and fired off three photos as he came running at me. And only one of them was in focus. And it was this one. And taking that picture, he was even angrier when I took that picture. And I instantly felt like it was maybe the wrong thing to have done. But it's interesting because in the years since, he's told me many times that he's glad I took this photo. He remembers how hard that time was. And he talks about it. And this picture represents that to him. I also tried to capture his perspective in my photos because I think a lot of people don't completely understand what, what it's like to have autism. And I mean, nobody, nobody can understand anybody else's perspective completely. But I think if people have a better understanding of that, it allows them to be more compassionate and to see it as less of a, a stereotypical thing, that it's, that it's better rounded. Um, so here he's using this gift he has of single-minded focus to solve a puzzle inside of a ball. And that focus, I think, is key to so many things. I think it brings him great joy. And I think it's also what may help him most in his life. Autism also comes with anxiety for a lot of people. Um, unpredictable things are really scary to my son. They break the order of the way he sees his world. And for many years, he was just completely terrified of thunderstorms. In this picture, he stood outside on the rise behind our house and watched this storm coming in. And he was worried it would be a tornado and couldn't stop watching the sky and worrying about whether the clouds were swirling or not. That anxiety is really part of his perspective. And I tried to get photos like this one that showed that emotion. I felt that the key to a successful photo was that vulnerability. We all feel anxious. And if we see that in a photo, we relate to it, we connect to it. And if I can show that in my picture, then somebody else who doesn't 
understand that perspective maybe a little, a little bit more. His anxiety has changed as he got older. Um, he stopped being as afraid of storms, but he began to be much more conscious of his own functioning of whether he was having a good day or a bad day in terms of his ability to relate to people. And then he has over time began to monitor it really carefully and to stay connected. It's really delicate. If he's hungry or he's tired or overstimulated, he just can't relate. And so here, in, when I took this, we were talking about how hard it is to control all those variables. I work also to um, balance the stronger emotions, the uh, sort of negative emotions with something that's a little less obvious. And that's this sort of poetic perspective. He has a really poetic way of seeing the world. And if you listen long enough and carefully enough, he speaks in these beautiful metaphors. You have to be comfortable with silence and, and waiting for him to say something. But when he does, it can be really profound. Here, he's just being present in something that he loves in flowing water. And he's always loved water and it's one of the metaphors he uses most often when he talks about a lot of things. And he talks about how water always finds a way. And he uses that as an analogy sometimes about his own persistence. One of the misconceptions people sometimes have about autism is that people on the spectrum have a lack of empathy. And that's really not true at all. And I try to show that in my work. I try really hard with that. Because of the barrier that we've talked about, it's it can take longer for him to share someone else's emotions. But when they do get through to him, he feels them very deeply. He can be it, just incredibly hard on himself if he accidentally offends someone or hurts someone. And that's what he was feeling when I took this photo. He's also been always very generous and unselfconscious about sharing his vulnerabilities and being in front of the camera. He doesn't have any artifice or any fake smile that he does or any of the things that people put up as a protection. Um, it makes him a really easy subject. And after years on the project, he knows what I like too. He brings me photos sometimes. This is a photo he brought me and it was winter. He had a cold and was getting bloody noses um, all the time and he was taking a bath and suddenly he had a nosebleed and he knew I would love to photograph it. So he called me into the bathroom specifically to do that. Out of the thousands and thousands of pictures, this is one of his favorite photos we've ever made together. I think he loves that he gave it to me as a gift. And he also loves that people have strong reactions to it and sometimes question whether it should have been made and whether he's okay. One of the most important things I try to instill in my kids, and it probably comes from a deep need to tell this to myself, is that it's okay if you're weird or different. That's okay. There's no requirement that you act just like everyone else. So sometimes we take photos like this one that are very strange and are simply designed to celebrate being different. Another thing we try to celebrate or I try to celebrate is the idea of progress and possibility. I've worked really, really hard as a mother to give my son every tool I can to help him function in a neurotypical world. But there's this point where he has to take on the responsibility of advancing his own life. And we still work together constantly, trying to help make his life easier. But I see glimpses of how he will control his own future someday. This photo is about that. Neither of us can look at this photo though without remembering taking it. I put a fog machine in his bedroom when the light was perfect for creating light rays. And we took tons of photos and suddenly his smoke detector went off. And something like that is absolutely awful for a person who has sensory issues. 
and hates things that are unpredictable. So he told me that we can never use the fog machine in the house again. So we don't get to do that, but I'm still glad I got to get this photo. In 2018, we did a Kickstarter to make a book of our photos. That was a fascinating experience, kind of like a master's level course in promotion and graphic design and things I really hadn't thought about before. It was a really great experience to share with him too. So I decided that I would start moving into film um, about the same time our book was published. I'd always loved the look of large format film. I am inspired by the work of photographers like Sally Mann who use that medium to create depth and tonality that somehow enhance the emotion in the image. I really wanted to do that. So moving from digital to large format was a process of steps for me. I began shooting medium format film and learned to develop it. Then about two years ago, I got a four by five camera and instantly fell in love with it. Now it's the format I shoot most often. Probably most people here already know about the process of large format, but I'll give you a quick overview just in case. To take a picture, you load sheets of film in the dark into holders when, you're, when you wanna go shoot. Then you set up your photo and you go under a dark cloth. And look, you look through the ground glass on the back of the camera. Everything is upside down and backwards. You focus and adjust things the way you want them to be. Then you come out from under the cloth, close the lens, cock the shutter, put in the film holder, remove the dark slide, and finally you get to take the picture. It's a slow process but practice makes it faster. This is one of the first photos I made with large format film. I began taking the camera on adventures with us, just as I did with my digital or medium format film cameras. It was heavier and definitely more cumbersome to shoot, but it became a natural part of our lives. My children quickly got used to it. For a lot of my work, I try to shoot in a semi-documentary way. The thing is, this is a format that doesn't really lend itself to candid shots. I leave the camera set up all the time and just move it around the house and yard and keep it near us. That way, if I want to make a photo of something, I can. It still requires me to ask people to hold still for a minute while I finish focusing and take the photo. One of the challenges with large format is that delay between focusing and, and taking the shot. I shoot using a really shallow depth of field a lot of the time, which gives a softness to the out of focus areas, but it also presents a problem. If people move between when you focus and when you shoot, they aren't in focus. My children are used to stopping and waiting for the photo, and I've gotten pretty fast. I try very hard to keep the delay from making my photos look too posed but that's always a challenge for me. And even though this format gives this beautiful three-dimensional quality to photos, it, I've learned it isn't enough to make what could be a boring photo into something great. I've learned that it needs to be more than just a portrait of a person, especially if I am going to be shooting the same people over and over. In order to have variety, I need to change something every time. There needs to be context and emotion, just like any other format. I try to concentrate on making images that tell the story of my family's life because it's what I have to share. Often I'm documenting interaction that was really going on at the time and I simply ask people to hold still for a minute while I make the photo. I also try to capture the feeling and perspective of childhood. I think that's relatable to everyone. We've all been kids and it helps to form a connection to the viewer. We remember that powerful experience of being a child. And if I can tap into that, I think the image works. I'm not always successful at that, but I do try. 
With large format, real candidates take a lot of luck. This is one of my favorite photos because it's completely candid. My dad was holding my two-year-old niece who can be very dramatic sometimes. She was inconsolable about some small slight and you can see the effect that her screaming has on him. I had the camera set up in the backyard and I just turned it toward them, focused quickly and took the photo. It shouldn't have worked. The depth of field was only about half an inch, but it did work. And because it was large format, the emotion and the magic of the moment are amplified. I also like adding an element that's just a little unsettling sometimes. My youngest son was obsessed with digging holes last summer. He loved spending time in the holes he had dug, completely unaware that it looked a little bit like he had dug himself a grave. To me, that dichotomy was the perfect inspiration for a photo. One of the best things about shooting large format is that you can manipulate the plane of focus. You can change the relationship between the lens and the film by making movements on the camera. This lets you selectively focus to get certain parts crisp and let others swirl out of focus. To me, this is a big part of the incredible power of large format to capture depth and add magic. Another thing I love about shooting family photos in large format is that you have to think very hard about your composition. With digital, I would regularly fire off two or 300 photos a day. But with large format film, it's never more than six. Instead of just being able to quickly push the shutter button, you have to take your time and you have to think and make sure what you're doing is right. And that process can be very calming. Here at the start of the pandemic, my husband was giving my son a haircut at home. Like everyone, I was very anxious this spring. Making photos like this, taking the time to carefully compose and focus the shot, that gives me a chance to be present and breathe for a minute. My kids are really easy subjects now. They can hold still for multiple second exposures and they somehow manage to portray emotion in almost every photo. They don't know how to smile on command for school photographers, which can be sort of a challenge when it's picture time. But I appreciate the genuine glimpses they give me of their thoughts and their personalities. Part of a family story, my family story is the objects of importance too. So I try to photograph those as well. In this picture, my mom is playing an Appalachian dulcimer my dad made for her when they were first married. And I use the camera movements to get the entire dulcimer in focus or at least most of it. I love experimenting with the camera movements and seeing what swings and tilts will do to the various elements of a scene. That's endlessly fascinating to me. This is another image with a narrow slice of focus that kind of goes through the picture at an angle. And I really enjoy what you can do with that creatively. You can put something in focus behind your subject to give context. I've never stopped photographing my eldest son and exploring how our relationship is impacted by autism, even though I'm shooting a different type of camera. We still do reflection photos sometimes and shots that explore how distance and barriers affect our connection. I still try to shoot his perspective and emotions. Here he was anxious about school starting soon, about the idea of being a high schooler and doing distance learning. This is another one where he was feeling overwhelmed by everything going on this spring and summer. I think anxiety is something that's easy to capture on film. And it can be powerful because we all experience it. We also take annual solstice photos every year, exploring our relationship with light. My son functions better in the dark and he likes keeping track of time when the sun and the sun rises and sets each day. So it's a fun project that we work on together. 
We made this one for our summer solstice last year. I also try to include sensory elements in my pictures if I can. I think that's an easy way for people to connect. Touch is one of the simplest elements to include um, because you can simply have items in the picture that have that sensory familiarity for the viewer. This one, the feeling of petals on skin. It's something that we've all experienced. Try to use as many senses as I can. Senses like, like a change in temperature. That's interesting to photograph. It's highly relatable, I think, for people. I also work to show our connection to our surroundings. This can be by echoing shapes like this photo where my son's arms match the exposed roots above him. Relationships are another huge theme in my family work. I try to show the connections people in our family feel with one another. Here, my parents are standing on a ridge trail on their anniversary. And I think of all of these red pines around them as the many events and challenges they've experienced together. Here's another anniversary photo of them taken the following year. Their relationship is at the heart of every other photo I make. So it's an important one for me to try to capture. I also try to show the experience of parenthood and the bond I feel with my sons. Some things are easier to express in a photo than they are in words. My husband doesn't love to be a subject in my photographs, um, but he will indulge me sometimes. When he does, I try to create photos that show how fatherhood requires both strength and softness, and how as parents, we have to lay ourselves open and remove all those emotional barriers we have. Love is a really natural emotion, I think, for kids, and my kids express it easily on film. A simple prompt of think about how much you love this person allows them to be present in that emotion while I make the picture. I try also to capture the bond my sons share. It's a complex one. Although they are six and a half years apart, my eldest son's autism changes their dynamic. In some ways, they are twins or siblings very close in age. My youngest cares for his older brother and reassures him, just as the oldest does for him. I feel like one of the most important roles in my life is to be present for the overlapping of the generations in my family. The relationship between my parents and my children is very special, and I'm honored to be able to document it in my work. In this photo, my dad is holding my son in his coat, and I just feel really lucky to be able to photograph them together. another project that I spent a lot of time working on last winter um, involved large format film, but a different, very different way of shooting it. Some of my work also includes self-portraiture, and that's a challenging thing to try to do for many reasons. Um, to take a self-portrait with large format film, you have to do all of the other things you normally would, but you also have to find something to focus on and then you have to position yourself where that thing was. And without being able to see anything, you have to take the picture. So there's a lot of chance already inherent in the process of taking a self-portrait. Um, but I had seen images where people had accidentally 
um, you experienced the static shock that had left a mark on the negative. And I was kind of captivated, captivated by that, by what that could convey, that if maybe I could harness that, the static could represent some unsaid emotion. So last winter, um, as the fears of the pandemic were increasing and the election year was starting and there was just a lot going on, I began a series of photos exploring the relationship between creativity and anxiety. I wanted to look at the question of how those two things interact with each other. When does anxiety act as a catalyst for creativity and when does it get in the way? So to do this, I made self-portraits on four by five film and I shocked them with static electricity. So I would first take the self-portrait and I used orthochromatic film so I could experiment with it under a red safe light. And then I would take the, the exposure I had made into the dark room and use this machine called a Wimshurst generator to create a static spark on the negative. You just crank the handle and sparks leap between the two contacts. So after I had shocked it, then I developed it. And the results were completely unpredictable. Sometimes the static would destroy the image completely and other times it wouldn't even show up. If I got the balance right though, it created fascinating patterns that enhanced the emotion in the shot. I tried a variety of techniques, using the static as a symbol of having an anxious, busy mind. I would mark where I wanted to shock the photo and sometimes the spark would actually land where I intended it to. More often it didn't. Most of these self-portraits are nudes because I wanted to show the intense emotional vulnerability required to create amid that kind of chaos and the noise of anxiety. I also tried to show the concept of harnessing this chaos, of making it work for you. Anxiety can be really hard to control, but if you can, it can sometimes be used as a tool. Sharing work as artists means putting our heart on the line and risking rejection. It's also the way that we can connect with other people. Like I learned in my first good photo of the scar, it takes overcoming your fear to share your genuine self through images. In making this series, I had to let go of control. I couldn't predict where the static would strike. I could kind of try to guide it, but a lot of it was luck. Making these meant letting go of the need to control every part of the photo and being comfortable with failure. Sometimes it went, the static went just where I wanted it to, or it would do things I didn't even predict or expect. I tried a few different techniques too. Um, in this one, I dragged the, the negative between the contacts to create kind of a whirlwind of, of static shocks. And I could also get the negative wet um, before I shocked it. And that made it harder for the static to travel across it, would create sort of a sparkling star pattern. This project, like all the photos I make, it was about using techniques and the camera to connect to other people. I hope people see my work and feel something. If they do that, no matter what method I use to achieve it, I feel like my work has succeeded. All right, I will stop screen sharing if I can.
Wow. Does anybody have any questions? <laughs> so if you have questions for Kate, you can type them. There's a little button at the bottom of your screen that says Q and A. Uh, well, and she can read out the questions and give you some few answers. There you go. Oh, right on, Steve. Steve says, outstanding. Thank you very much. It was outstanding. I mean, I'd have one quick question for you, Kate, about the, the static electricity ones. Mm -hmm. How did you introduce that color? Did that, did you put that in post somehow or? Yeah, that's digital toning. I tried different things. I tried painting on the negative and using markers and different things, but um, it, none of it, it just ended up being distracting. So I tried yeah. it digitally. Sure. Well, there's some more questions. Okay. If you want to go ahead and read those out, Kate, you can, there's one from here. Uh, yeah, let's see. Lots of people saying nice things. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Um, as a parent, I find it, Omar says, as a parent, I find it hard to find the time. How do you do this? I have a hard time with 35 millimeter, let alone large format. Um, I just keep a camera out all the time, multiple cameras, really. Um, they're just there. They're, they come with me. Um, when I was shooting digital, I always had a camera in my purse. Um, didn't go anywhere without it. And that way it's just easy. It's just part of life. You just take it out and everybody's used to it. You know, I think I remember as a parent, I remember feeling like the days were actually quite long. And, <laughs> yeah, there was that. You know, and I took pictures too, not as intently or as effectively as you did, but I found that it was the choice between another game of hi-ho cheerio. Right. And take some pictures. Yeah. There yeah. was time for the pictures. Yeah. Yeah. Yep, and they can play the hi ho cheerio, and you can get a you can get a picture of them doing that, and you're sort of you're sort of involved. <laughs> um, um, Ann asks, "What type of camera did you use for your first photos before the large format?" Um, those the autism photos are mostly taken with a Nikon D750 and prime lenses. Um, Oh, people are saying really nice things. <laughs> well, those are all, those are good. Let's see what else. <laughs> um, can you talk a little bit about, um, I've, I've had a, I have a friend who's an author and he's, he said one of the things that bothers him the most once he gives a talk about a book is they come up and say, well, what's next? <laughs> <laughs> but I'm going to do that to you anyway. So, sure. <laughs> uh, you know, are you, are you, you have anything in mind for when the pandemic loosens, loosens up a little bit or is this kind of onward and forward? Yeah, no, I do. Um, I try, I, I set goals for myself every year. And one of the things I try to do is think about what it is I need to learn next or, or what I need to shoot next in order to develop as a photographer. And I have decided, I think the thing that's really holding me um, back is my fear of shooting people who aren't my family. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna try to do more of that and maybe some models, we'll see. Um, need to figure out what I'd wanna say with that series. But. Sure. I think there's a question in the chat box now to our, our couple, if you wanna check there. Yes, oh, and Andrew says, do you always have specific intentions for each image before shooting? Um, no, uh, I, I have, light. I, I usually try to make sure I know what's going on with the light. And then I just have a conversation a lot of the time. Um, I do sometimes a little bit of conceptual kind of stuff where I'll bring in something. Um, but often I'm just trying to get something genuine, some kind of, some kind of emotion. Nice. Um, or says, it seems that you're making a real journey with your photography to talk about autism. Can you talk about that a little bit more? Um, sure. Yeah. One thing I'm trying to work on now is um, documenting what it's like to be a, a teenager with autism. Uh, my son's going to be 14 in a couple weeks. And I think it's already a hard experience to 
become a teenager, to be a teenager. There's a lot of change that's inherent in that. And if you're, you're someone who doesn't love change, that's, that adds some extra challenge. So, um, Rebecca asks if my children are interested in taking photos. Uh, not my eldest, um, except with his iPad, he takes photos of waterfalls, <laughs> but um, that's more for him. <laughs> uh, my youngest, though, he, he does enjoy that. He's the kind of person who likes to share everybody's things that they do, and so he uses a brownie box camera that he has named Mr. Top Hat, and we've been doing some stuff with that. Um, Manuela asks, uh, when you started developing your large format film, how long did it take you to teach yourself or did someone show you? And where did you find the materials for creating your darkroom? And do I sometimes still shoot digital? Um, I do not shoot digital very much anymore. I'm trying to make myself because I think I missed some things by not shooting digital. Um, developing, I had friends who showed me the basic process. Um, and the dark room, my dark room is really half bathroom in my house that I have made light tight. <laughs> so, um, Kim says, thank you for sharing. I've asked my beginning photography students to attend today. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I like Kim. We're moving into our portraiture assignments soon and thinking about the ethics of representation in photography. Thank you for speaking to your relationship with your son and family. Can you offer some direct advice to students who will soon be exploring how to work compassionately in order to create their portraits? That's a great question. Um, and it's something I think about a lot of the time. I, I think it's, you're, you have to try not to take a photo. Uh, it's, it needs to be a collaboration. And if, and the person who is sitting for you is, is giving you the gift of being vulnerable to your lens. And as long as you're cognizant of that, you're probably going to make a, a picture that is sensitive. Nice. Carla says, have you continued shooting digital work or transitioned to making all of your images in large format? And do you feel like there is still some work you want to do that is that the digital camera enables? Um, yeah, I, I do. I think, I mean, I, the digital camera doesn't call to me the same way. Um, I feel like for me, the, the effort that I put into film and the, um, the work it takes and the time it takes to to work on the composition makes me care more about those images. Um, but at the same time, I also realize that I miss some of the everyday important moments um, that I used to get because I am I have fewer shots on film and I have to take more time and I miss things. So I'm trying to shoot more digital for that reason. <laughs> um, Anne asks, what was your original inspiration for shocking your images? Oh, thanks, Anne, about the presentation. She said it was very wonderful. <laughs> um, uh, my original inspiration was um, I, saw, I, I saw these photos where people had done the accidental static shock, and it looked, it could add this sort of element that, that seemed almost otherworldly and um, I think that there are a lot of emotions that, that we don't have names for and that if I can, that, that maybe it, it allows that, you know. Mm -hmm. Melanie asks, do your kids ever get behind the camera? They just, my youngest, a little bit. Um, he took actually this picture of me here <laughs> um, with, his, with his box camera. Molly asks if I studied photography. I didn't. Um, I majored in English, and I am just really obsessive as a photographer. <laughs> um, yeah. Lots of people saying nice things, huh? Yes, very. <laughs> Everybody's been really nice. <laughs> Um, Benjamin asks, do you have any plans to do any projects uh, in the special needs community beyond my own family? Um, I'm not sure. I, I'm really, I am really anxious 
socially as a person, it's really hard for me to talk to other people that I'm not comfortable with. And so if I can overcome that, then yeah, definitely. I mean, I think there's a, I think there's a really unique perspective in the special needs community and people don't really, they, don't, they only see part of that. Um, Rolf asks, do you only scan? Um, yes, I, at this point, I only scan. I am hoping to get into printing maybe this year. Um, right now I'm, I have the sort of hybrid workflow. <laughs> Rob asks, do you have a small purse camera or a big purse for the Nikon? <laughs> a big purse for the Nikon. <laughs> and no purse is big enough for the, eight by 10, so. <laughs> um, Andrew asks what medium the final images are, print or scan negatives. Um, scan negatives and sometimes I make a digital print from that. Samantha asks, um, Kate is a talented writer as well, so I'm curious to know how photogra photographing a subject feels to her versus describing a scene in writing. Um, that's so awesome. <laughs> um, it's basically, I think of it like a poem, uh, just a really distilled, super, super distilled way of, of sharing something with somebody, take out everything extraneous. Um, let's see. Pat says, beautiful presentation, Kate. I grew up with a brother who was disabled with muscular dystrophy. He was in a wheelchair, he was wheelchair bound for most of his life. I love my brother dearly, but often I had trouble, especially as a young girl, understanding how he related to the world from his own perspective and experience. I love how you attempt to show that in your images in the world from your son's perspective. Of course, when we make images, much of what we shoot is from our own perspective too. Did you discuss the feelings and emotions you wanted to convey with your son as you were making the photos? Were you able to capture what you felt to be that emotion? How did he usually react to the finished photos? Was it different from how he reacted during the shoot? I admire your work greatly. Um, thank you. Uh, we talk a lot. Um, we always have about how he's feeling. And, I, and one of the things that's great about him is he's really self-aware. Um, so he and he's really verbal, um, sometimes too verbal. <laughs> but he, he and I talk a lot about how, he, how he's feeling and what his perspective is. So I guess as much as you can share anyone else's perspective, I think I have a fairly good sense of it. Um, and he does, he does appreciate that about the, the, the photos that we've done. He says it's, it's accurate, so. Um, let's see. Leon says, at first, thank you so very much. I have no words for it yet, but this touches deeply. You gave a wonderful presentation and described your process so wonderfully. Your pictures are so fascinating. And the rendition and tonality is so very soft and soothing. May I ask which lens and film you use to capture those wonderful stories? Um, yeah, definitely. I, the film varies. Um, I use a lot of Fomapan 100 because it's cheap. Um, and I shoot so much <laughs> that I need it to be cheap. Um, and I also like, I like it. It's got some quality control issues, but it's, it's a great film. Um, as far as the lens, um, most often on four by five, I use a Schneider Zenar 150 millimeter F3.5. It's from the, it's from 1928 and it's, um, it's, it's good. It's, um, not a really expensive lens or anything. Um, I also shoot a Kodak Aero Ektar in 4x5, uh, which is sort of famous for its rendition, but um, that's an aerial lens from World War II. Um, Leland says, I love the way you incorporated the static. I'm curious about your printing interests. What processes are you drawn to for your work? Um, I barely know anything at this point. <laughs> um, I've done a little bit of cyanotypes. Um, so I'd like to do more alternative processes like that. I really like the idea of the raw materials being just chemicals and light. And 
that's that is intriguing to me that there's nothing electronic that is involved in in the process and I don't know that speaks to me but I'm not sure what direction I'll go exactly I think that might be it unless I've missed anybody I think there's a couple in the chat box here let's see oh okay let's see You see those? Let me see. I do see the chat. Let's see. Oh, uh, when did I start shooting eight by ten? Um, like I got it for Christmas, <laughs> so, <laughs> so a month ago. <laughs> um, and I don't have a shutter for that camera yet. Um, I, I have a Packard shutter that's coming, but. So I'm using a dark slide in front of the lens and that is, is a little bit challenging, um, but I'm starting to get the hang of it. <laughs> right on. Well, thank you. I think that's yeah. all the questions. Um, really well done, appreciate it. Uh, there is a YouTube channel that the Portland Art Museum uh, hosts uh, and eventually all of these brown bag talks will be posted on there. So if you wanna revisit this, or if you missed it and one of your friends saw it, they can send you that way. Uh, things are moving a little slowly in that area to museum these days. So uh, sit tight and it will be up there eventually. Uh, thank you very much. I think it was a lovely, lovely talk and your work is very inspirational for everybody. Oh, thanks Ray and thanks for having me. Yep.